Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I'm Nazia Iqbal and here's a look at the stories for the day. Ramu, do chai de yaar. Are nahi yaar. Ek chai coffee. We Indians disagree on everything. But we agree, SBI is the banker to every Indian. SBI ka home loan, I agree with you. SBI is the banker to every Indian. Another electric scooter erupted in flames last week, adding fuel to the already raging debate around its safety. It also triggered a warning from Union Minister Nitin Gadkari, who asked negligent companies to mend their ways or face action. A lot is at stake for the government too. which has now come out with a draft on battery swapping policy offering a host of incentives including gst cut so will battery swapping address the safety concerns plaguing the electric two wheelers and will these incentives lure the ev makers towards the battery swapping model from the existing fixed battery model watch this report to know Just as public trust in electric vehicles was taking a hit amid a spate of fire incidents involving e-scooters, government think tank Niti Aayog came out with the much-awaited draft policy on battery swapping last week. Targeted at electric two- and three-wheelers, the policy aims to drive large-scale adoption of EVs by promoting the use of the nascent but rapidly growing battery swapping technology and encouraging collaboration among the stakeholders. Battery swapping falls under the broader umbrella of battery as a service business model where users purchase an EV without the battery which significantly lowers upfront costs. They pay a regular subscription fee to service providers for battery services throughout the vehicle's lifetime. To bring battery swapping into the mainstream, the draft policy promotes open architecture and aims to create a framework for greater interoperability between EVs and batteries. The batteries will have to be compatible with different EV models and with different battery charging stations. Niti Aayog also said the policy will not mandate a rigid set of technical and operational requirements to foster interoperability, leaving room for innovation. When it comes to safety, a rigorous testing protocol has been proposed to avoid any unwanted temperature rise at the electrical interface. Batteries are required to be enabled with battery management system or BMS for efficient battery monitoring. data analysis and safety the bms must be self certified and open for testing to check its compatibility with various systems and capability to meet safety requirements swappable batteries will have to be equipped with advanced features like iot based battery monitoring systems remote monitoring and immobilization capabilities apart from asking the gst council to consider reducing the tax on lithium ion batteries to 5% Niti Aayog suggested that incentives for vehicles with fixed batteries be extended to swappable battery vehicles. Pulkit Khurana, the co-founder of Battery Smart, which operates a network of over 200 swap stations in 10 cities, says that Niti Aayog has incorporated most of the feedback raised by his startup as well as other companies during stakeholder discussions with the government last month. Uh, so we are super happy about uh, what has come out in this policy. Can it actually address all the incentives that the industry was seeking for? Uh, bringing it under the uh, fame subsidy scheme and uh, the policy went over and above to also say that uh, preferred tariffs would be provided for electricity uh, preferred land parcels could be provided by government it actually lays out a framework where multiple interoperable uh, ecosystems could could uh, rise right and uh, will be promoted as long as they are open for different oems to plug and play so that is a great boost for someone like us and uh, there is emphasis on safety which everyone has been asking for including us because as long as there are certain mandatory uh, specifications on the battery and charger safety it is very difficult to push manufacturers uh, to abide by them so so if you currently today buy a scooter or a three wheeler uh, you will be charged 5% gst right which all, obviously already includes the battery as well but we as a swap station network when we go and procure batteries we pay 80% gst on those batteries so that is what the parity would bring that the battery should also be when independently being procured should be charged at 5% so uh, 
so i i i don't see any area which the draft has not addressed uh, except for some very minor points which were in the first note that came out so around insurance of these batteries uh, on how that would be addressed the policy provides clarity for ev buyers on who to approach for grievance redressal the battery providers are designated as the point of contact and will be responsible in coordination with other ecosystem players for handling any type of complaint The draft says they will be also responsible for channeling monetary compensation to the EV owners if necessary. Depending on the particulars of the case, a battery provider may recover these costs from other ecosystem players too. For instance, the vehicle manufacturer. Arun Shayas, the co-founder of Race Energy, which manufactures swap stations and swappable batteries, questioned the policy push towards interoperability. He said there could be practical challenges in implementing that and could pose a safety risk. I think in in general sense the policy has been a, a good step in the right direction in terms of the incentivization you know in terms of the reduction of GST rate you know even down to the last points like providing some unique identification number to each battery and station what one has to be careful about uh, in terms of interoperability it would be quite difficult uh, to fix on one particular uh, dimension uh, as such and providing uh multiple manufacturers to work on that particular uh, dimension and and I think along with the dimension comes uh standardizing the connector as well because it kind of forces the whole uh industry and the whole the whole battery swapping technology to kind of like think inside the box and not really outside the box once you fix up on your dimensions you're fixing up on more more or less what kind of cells you can use uh what sort and with that what sort of chemistry is that you can use you're seeing a lot of these fire incidents that are happening and the moment you have different kinds of battery packs different kinds of chemistries working together as i said and if you have four or six batteries this could lead to a, a huge uh, risk of thermal runaway issues as well and we completely do not believe that it is the right time to do that uh, what we want is like four or five natural networks based on how the uh, the market has grown let the let the companies come up with because a lot of these companies including us have been working on this technology for a while so uh, we just want to be 100% sure that like you know there's no uh, there's no one particular dimension fixed or in the worst case situation one particular manufacturer's dimensions has been fixed while the industry seems split on the issue of interoperability the draft policy by and large promises leeway for innovation by touching upon the aspects of incentives gst safety interoperability and accountability the comprehensive set of policy recommendations can establish the battery as a service model as an alternative to the fixed battery and traditional internal combustion engine vehicles sab achhi dikh rahi hain yaar kaun se kare dun ye to wahi baat hui 4000 shares listed hai kaun sa lu wo to sabse aasan hai tujhe 5 paisa nahi pata Shhh, अब तो सबको पता है फाइव पैसा पर है चार हजार स्टॉक्स की रिसर्च टेक्निकल टूल्स और इन्वेस्टमेंट आइडियाज डाउनलोड फाइव पैसा नाउ अब तो सबको पता है इन्वेस्टिंग मेड इजी एंड रिपोर्टिंग विद फाइव पैसा इन्वेस्टमेंट इन सिक्योरिटीज मार्केट आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल द रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट केयरफुल बिफोर इन्वेस्टिंग charging of evs in smaller cities is also one of the concerns due to increasing power outages meanwhile suman sinha ceo of renew power and president of asocham says the private sector capex in sectors like power is picking up it may change things for the better in an interview with business standards arup roy choudhury sinha also tells why india is well placed for a good growth rate of 6 to 8% per annum if external risks don't upset the cart let's listen in now that we are on a path of recovery we find ourselves in a position where there is a disruption in global supply chains and there is a volatility in uh, commodity prices what is your assessment of fiscal year of financial year Look, I think uh, macroeconomically, India is actually in a pretty enviable position right now. The reason is that we had a lot of structural issues that we have spent time and effort and energy in resolving over the last several years, and um, we are now at a point where we can reap the benefits of that through uh, hopefully over the next several years of rapid growth. And there are some, of course, external risks uh, which are around the Fed increasing interest rates. and a lot of the other geopolitical issues that are going on around the world and therefore the impact of that on 
things like commodity prices and um, oil markets and so on. Now, those are, to my mind, the only potential external risks out there. But as far as the Indian economy is concerned, I, th I think we're in a pretty healthy position. Uh, demand is likely to grow pretty robustly. Uh, corporates are delevered. They're in a position to start investing for uh, creating capacity for the future. And if none of these external risks come to pass, then I would think that we should be um, you know, well positioned to many years of of uh, fairly good growth rates of 6 to 8%. While there is usually no question on that India is going to regist could register a better growth than other, other uh, comparable nations, uh, but even by the RBI's own admission, right now the bigger issue is inflation. How do you see inflation impacting businesses? The reality is that uh, not all cost increases can be passed on to consumers because um, it tends to have an impact on um, demand as well. And so, therefore, uh, the reality is that corporates will have to absorb some of this uh, inflationary impact, and uh, that will impact margins going forward. Um, now, uh, and, and you know, it's not just inflation in uh, in um, in goods; it's also uh, interest rates going up. That will also impact uh, uh, you know corporates' uh, bottom lines. So, I think, therefore, uh, there will be, I think, growth. So, top lines will grow. Volume growth will be there, but margins, I think, might be impacted. Now, how much the, that impact is remains to be seen, but therefore, there will be accretion to bottom lines. But whether it is at the same level at, as volume growth or at a lower level than that because of margin re reduction in the middle, really is something we'll have to wait and see. My feeling is that in all probability, you'll see uh, corporates having to shrink some of their margins because we cannot simply pass on all the uh, inflationary impact on to end customers. Uh, Mr. Sinha, uh, it's been a long wait for private sector capex to come in, especially since the pandemic. Uh, investment has mostly been driven by state and central governments. And uh, while there are some signs of a turnaround in private sector capex, by when do you think is it really going to pick up? I think it's already picking up right now. You see the amount of investments happening, certainly in the infrastructure space, it's uh, quite good. Um, uh, there's a lot of capital that is continued to come into the country. So that is also allowing corporates to leverage their investment capability by raising capital from outside. Uh, and then, uh, of course, I don't know the exact numbers at this point for capacity utilizations, but I would, I would uh, hazard a guess and say that we are uh, at this point uh, getting to a situation where excess capacities have been worked through. And therefore, as demand grows, we need to create new capacities. And to me, one of the best examples of that is the power sector, the one that I obviously operate in. You are seeing that uh, that uh, demand is growing very robustly, and demand for power only grows if the whole economy is growing. And so, therefore, it's a it's a uh, you know it's an indicator of that uh, fact. And within the power sector, we need to add capacities, new capacities, very very rapidly if we are to meet this demand growth. And frankly, we are not uh, being able to do that fast enough. And also, we need to we need to obviously mine more coal as well because ultimately, you know, more than seventy percent of India's power yes. uh, consum uh, consumption is made from coal. So we need to also therefore mine mine more coal and per per perhaps even you know have more coal mines, etc. So so that is my sector. I think similarly in the cement sector, the real estate sector, uh, in the real estate sector, you're seeing prices beginning to take up as well. So I think across the board, I think there is demand pickup happening and that will require more investment. Hospitality, tourism, retail, cinemas and all. And, you know, as you know, these have been the worst hit by the three waves of pandemic. And uh, this is the only sector which is struggling to go back to previous to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, now, uh, government has taken some steps, uh, including the emergency credit guarantee scheme and extension and all. Uh, do you think that is enough? And what more do you think can be done to revive this very key sector? Look, I, I think that uh, you're absolutely right. Um, that sector has been impacted quite significantly. But there's also only so much that the government can do other than to give them outright handouts to allow them to pay their people and to keep surviving and servicing their debts and other issues and so on. I think ultimately we need the economy to pick up. And uh, the good news is that even though Right now, cases are ticking up a little bit, only a little bit in certain parts of India. 
the reality is that this is a much milder version of uh, covid and economic activity i think should carry on plus people are to some extent quite now fatigued with all of this lockdowns and this that and the other so i suspect people are just going to carry on in the normal way and uh, the number of cases might very well therefore go up but as long as there's no hospital hospitalization it's fine now why am i making such a big deal of this because as you rightly said that this sector that you're talking about the tourism sector the travel sector etc is impacted by that but if people go around the normal business then we'll see massive you know we'll see massive pent up demand surfacing and you're already seeing that right now uh, thank you so okay. much for your time okay thank you arup take care yaar mat puch yaar फिर से स्टॉक्स में फंस गया तो स्टॉक्स के साथ बॉन्ड्स इंश्योरेंस गोल्ड में बैलेंस कर इसमें बहुत तामचा में तुझे फाइव पैसा नहीं पता अब तो सबको पता है फाइव पैसा है ऑल इन वन अकाउंट डाउनलोड फाइव पैसा नाउ अब तो सबको पता है Investing made easy and rewarding with five paisa. Investments in securities market are subject to market risks. Read all the related documents carefully before investing. The United States too is feeling the inflation heat, which is at a four-decade high of 8.5 percent. And after U.S. Fed Chief Jerome Powell hinted at a 50 basis point rate hike in May. The Indian markets crashed last Friday. The Nifty 50 and S&P BSE Sensex snapped their two-day winning streak and slipped 1.27 percent and 1.23 percent, respectively. Does this mean a bearish market for investors from here on? Here's a report. Frontline indices have tumbled around 5% each since October 2021 after hawkish global central banks especially the US Federal Reserve spooked investors out of their easy money bubble. The Russia Ukraine war also added fuel to the fire as it elevated prices of key commodities especially Brent crude to a 14 year high. However, a wave of gloom spilled across Asian markets last Friday with India as no exception. as the US Fed hinted at 50 bps rate hike in May while analysts assert that the markets are already pricing in the rate hike the quantum of hike and the pace can trigger a knee jerk reaction market analyst ur bhat for instance expects that the markets will eventually price in the rate hike and later recover the lost ground the pace of tightening is only potential surprise so otherwise uh, that they will tighten and that they will probably do it at uh, 25 basis point each time is a given now uh, whatever eight, eight or nine times uh, during the next 12 months but i think if they do with the um, accelerated um, sort of uh, uh, cuts sorry accelerated hike uh, like say 50 basis point is that could probably be a potential surprise and that could probably affect the trend but i don't think um, they're increasing by 25 basis point is really going to affect the trend too much because it's all well known and already factored in when actually shifty basis point happens i think there would be some sort of uh, reaction in the market but it that will also get absorbed because it's just a matter of pace now um that it will go up by whatever you know eight or 10 times uh, which is about you know more than 2% uh, that is a given <laughs> okay. so if they do it very fast at 50 basis point they can four times instead of 25 basis point eight times then that i think might as a sentiment effect the, the the number is well known no, that they would do it over 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 eight times or 10 times or something like that so two to two to two and a half percent hike is a given uh, within the next say what 18 months or something like that now the pace is the only surprise that can be vk vijay kumar of geojit financial services too believes the fed's half point hike may temporarily steer markets in negative territory The comment by Fed Chief Jerome Powell that a 50 BPS rate hike is possible in May and the need to control inflation has pushed the 10-year bond yield above 2.9 percent, says Vijay Kumar. While the market has already discounted this hawkishness of the U.S. Fed, investors should buy high-quality stocks on steep corrections and wait with patience in this time of uncertainty, he suggests. However, global brokerage Nomura is of the view that the US central bank will aggressively raise rates by 75 BPS combined in its June and July meetings. It also believes that though markets have been reluctant 
to price 75 DPS hike, a stronger pricing for such a move would ease the path for the FOMC. Moreover, following the 275 DPS hikes in June and July, Nomura expects the US Fed to hike rates by 25 DPS at every meeting scheduled in 2022 and 2023. They expect 300 DPS of cumulative tightening this year, up from their previous forecast of 250 DPS. Against this backdrop, Global Q's bond yield movement and macroeconomic developments will guide the markets this week. Back home, investors will react to private lender ICICI Bank's Q4 results in trade today. Later in the week, nine Nifty companies are expected to report their Q4 scorecard, including Bajaj Twins, HDFC Life, Bajaj Auto, HUL, Axis Bank, Maruti Suzuki, Ultra Tech Cement, and Wipro. अब क्या किया? Shares में trading. तुम्हें file पैसा नहीं पता? ओए! अब तो सबको पता है। Five पैसा पर मिलते हैं research tools, portfolio analytics और investment ideas भी। Download five पैसा now. अब तो सबको पता है। Investing made easy and rewarding with five पैसा. Investments in securities market are subject to market risks. Read all the related documents carefully before investing. After the flight of capital from the stock markets, let's turn to literal flight. In today's digitally connected world, leaving the land was the only way to leave the internet connectivity behind, literally. But that's no more possible now. First the technology and then the government has allowed use of the internet on flight. But ever wondered how it works? Let's find out in our next report. Earlier, air travel and internet access were considered mutually exclusive. If you were taking a flight, you would be logging out of the digital world. Then, in March of 2020, the government permitted airlines operating in India to provide in-flight Wi-Fi services to passengers. Flying hasn't been a pleasant experience amid COVID-19, to say the least. But at least, unlike before the pandemic, you don't have to enter a bubble of internet silence because you're on a flight. Now, while being airborne, you can call people, check your Facebook, watch YouTube videos, and answer office emails. Online entertainment can be a lifesaver during a long flight, especially if the in-flight collection is stale. But how is this made possible? Primarily, in-flight internet systems are based on two kinds of technology. The first is an air-to-ground system. Here, an antenna on board the aircraft will pick up signals from the nearest tower on the ground. Up to a certain altitude, the connection will remain seamless. This is of course unless the aircraft passes over an area without ground towers. Basically, the ground towers project signals upwards. Also, the onboard antennas used in this case are fitted beneath the airplane. Then there is the satellite-based Wi-Fi system. Here, satellites beam signals directly to antennas installed on the aircraft. Meanwhile, air-to-ground based networks use satellites to beam the signal to a ground-based transmitter first and then to the antennas on board the aircraft. The satellite-based system is more effective when the aircraft is flying over the sea. In a satellite-based Wi-Fi system, the onboard antennas are fitted on the top side of the aircraft and they have to constantly adjust their position to receive signals. The data is transmitted to the passenger's personal device through an onboard router, which in turn is connected to the aircraft's antenna. When the aircraft reaches an altitude of 3000 meters, the onboard antenna will switch to satellite based services. Yar, ice cream khaye? Nahi ya, kulfi. We Indians disagree on everything, but we agree SBI is the banker to every Indian. Are you SBI contactless debit card? I agree. SBI is the banker to every Indian. Despite permission, Indian airlines have been slow in rolling out Wi-Fi service for passengers. Vistara was the first one to offer it in September 2020 in a few aircrafts. Costly equipment, which comes for 4 crore rupees or more, and impact of pandemic have been the reason for slow rollout. 
Well, that's all we have for you today. We will be back with more news and analysis in our next episode. Stay tuned. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.